This is chapter four, part B, functional anatomy of prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. So at the end of part A, we left off talking about the differences between gram-positive and gram-negative cell walls. So this difference forms the basis of the gram stain mechanism. Gram stain is probably one of the most important stains you'll learn in the laboratory because it can help determine the treatment for certain types of infections. So the mechanism behind the gram stain is that our primary stain, crystal violet, so it's called crystal violet because it forms crystals and is violet, it's purple. The crystal violet and the iodine have a chemical reaction that causes the stain to form these crystals inside of the cell. So once the crystals have formed, the next step is alcohol decolorizer. So the alcohol will dehydrate the peptidoglycan in a gram positive. So all of those violet purple crystals from the stain will be trapped kind of in this maze and labyrinth of peptidoglycan. So this is why they're gram positive. So they will still show that purple or violet color. With gram negative, the alcohol decolorizer step is going to dissolve this outer membrane and leave holes in our already thin layer of peptidoglycan. So it's easy enough for those crystal violet crystals to be washed away. Right, so during our decolorization step, right, we're removing the purple color from the gram negative. So then we have to add a counter stain, which is usually safranin. So the gram negative cells will show up red under the microscope. So here are some gram positive bacteria versus some gram negative. So in four steps of the gram stain, you apply the crystal violet. We apply the iodine, so it's considered the mordant or kind of the mortar of the gram stain. So it's going to have a chemical reaction and cause those crystals to form. Right, the crystals get trapped in the thick peptidoglycan of the gram positive. Uh, so during the alcohol wash or decolorization, it's going to dehydrate the peptidoglycan, kind of trap those crystals. Um, and in the gram negative, it's going to dissolve that outer plasma membrane. So your gram negative now have no violet crystals. So they are essentially decolorized. So that we can see them under the microscope and they show up, we'll add our counter stain, which is safranin. Um, so now we'll have this contrast in color between the gram positive and the gram negative. So because the gram positive cell walls have a single membrane, they only have a single pair of those rings in their flagella. Gram positive cells can be capable of producing exotoxins. And they have a higher susceptibility to penicillin and can be disrupted by lysozyme. Right, so again, they don't have that extra outer layer, so it's a bit easier to get through to damage these cells. Gram-negative cells, being that they have two membranes, they need two pairs of rings in their flagella. They produce exotoxins as well as those endotoxins, so that lipid A and the lipopolysaccharide in the outer membrane. Um, and they have low susceptibility to penicillin, let's begin, because they have that extra protective layer with that outer membrane. So maybe one way to help you remember the differences between gram-positive and gram-negative, think of a boring, long PowerPoint presentation. I'm sure you can think of one you've heard recently. So use long PowerPoint as your mnemonic guide. So L-O-N-G. Lipopolysaccharide, outer membrane, negative gram. Positive peptidoglycan, tychoic acid. So, of course, not all cells will fall under the gram stain rule. So, we do have some atypical cell walls that we'll deal with occasionally. So, acid fast cell walls will appear or stain like gram positive cell walls, but they're not a, they're not a true gram positive. Because remember, the gram-positive result was due to the peptidoglycan, right, that thick peptidoglycan layer. Acid-fast bacteria have a waxy lipid layer called mycolic acid um, that's bound to their peptidoglycan. This would also kind of trap some of those gram stains 
So they may appear gram positive, but it's not because of the thick peptidoglycan layer. So these type of cells require their own special stain. So the acid fat stain uses carbol fusion. So it's a red or pink stain. So the mycobacterium are your type of bacteria that have this mycolic acid or your acid fast bacteria. Archaea also have atypical cell walls, but you're much less likely to encounter archaea bacteria. Um, so they're generally either wall-less or they have um, a pseudopeptidoglycan cell wall. So here is a normal gram-positive. Right? So the green bricks are the peptidoglycan. Um, so this is an archaeal cell wall. So it still has a cell membrane, a phospholipid bilayer, but its cell wall is slightly different than the peptidoglycan. So pseudo meaning fake, so it's kind of like a fake peptidoglycan. Any damage to the cell wall can affect the overall cell function. So lysozyme can break down the chemical bonds in that peptidoglycan, so kind of chemically digest that molecule. Um, penicillin can inhibit peptidoglycan from being formed in the first place. Right, so different antibiotics, antimicrobial treatments, we try to have a plan of attack. So how can we weaken this cell? So we can either break down the molecules it's already made, or we can prevent it from making those molecules in the first place. So this is showing bacterial growth with penicillin versus without penicillin. So you see all of these bacteria start to die because if we can't form these polypeptide bridges, we can't link our logs together, then we can't form our peptidoglycan raft. Once a cell wall has been damaged, the cell is referred to as a protoplast if it's a gram positive or a spheroplast if it's a gram negative. So again, gram positive has a thicker cell wall, so shown in red. So if we encounter a antibiotic or antimicrobial that's going to break down our cell wall, but we still have our cell membrane, our inner membrane. So this is now referred to as a protoplast. A spheroplast is a gram negative cell that has lost its cell wall. So this thin red layer has been broken down or removed. So now we just have a double layer of cell membrane. So because the cells have lost their protective, more rigid outer layer with their cell wall, they're going to be more susceptible to osmotic lysis. So water rushing into the cell or leaving the cell, changing its shape, um, and potentially killing it. L forms are these wallless cells that swell or shrink into irregular shapes. So the cells lost its cell wall, so it's going to start to take on water and fluid and swell and get these odd shapes and eventually maybe even burst. The plasma membrane is the same in prokaryotes as eukaryotes, so it's composed of a phospholipid bilayer. It contains peripheral proteins um, kind of on the surface and the sides of the membrane and integral proteins that span the entire length or thickness of the membrane. So looking at an actual picture of a bacterial cell wall and cell membrane, you can see the red is the peptidoglycan that's sandwiched between these thin blue lines of plasma membrane. Plasma membrane is said to be a fluid mosaic model. So mosaic meaning made up of lots of individual pieces, lots of smaller pieces to make a bigger picture. So the membrane is not rigid, it's very viscous, kind of oily. Um, some proteins are able to kind of float freely throughout the membrane for various functions. Um, other proteins will be kind of permanently attached to certain locations. These phospholipids have some give to them, so they're able to move kind of with the flow of the cytoplasm and the extracellular fluid. The membrane is also self-sealing, so any hole left behind by this protein, if it were to move over here, would just be resealed by those phospholipids. Function of the cell membrane is to regulate passage of substances in and out of the cell. So it's said to be selectively permeable. So permeable just means things can pass through it. Um, selective means only certain things can pass through it. 
The cell membrane also contains enzymes for ATP energy production, which we'll talk about in a later chapter with microbial metabolism. There are two basic ways that we can move substances across these membranes. So your passive processes, we're moving from high to low concentration. So passive meaning it just kind of happens. So no energy is expended. So riding your bike downhill, floating downstream, okay, all passive as opposed to active processes. So now we're moving from low to high concentration. So we're moving against the flow, against that gradient. It's gonna require some energy, right? So it's a more active transport. So you're riding your bike uphill, you're swimming upstream. Right? It's gonna require more energy. One type of passive process is simple diffusion. So this is basically just what it sounds like. It's very simple. Solute goes from high to low concentration straight through the membrane. So diffusion will occur until an equilibrium is reached. So like most things in nature, it's trying to reach that balance. So once the particles are equal inside and outside of the cell and the membrane, the net movement or change will stop. Facilitated diffusion is still a passive process. It just involves a little assistance. So it has to be facilitated or arranged by another solute or a transporter protein. So the solute will combine with its transporter protein and then it will be carried through the membrane. Osmosis is the diffusion of water across the selectively permeable membrane. So it's still diffusion in the sense that we're going from a high to low concentration. But before, when we talked about diffusion, we were talking about solutes or chemicals and molecules that were moving from high to low. Osmosis is looking at actual water molecules that are moving from high to low. So some water molecules can pass through simple diffusion straight through the membrane, although not as quickly or efficiently. So they have their own special channel or passageways called aquaporins, right, or water pores, right, that go through the entire membrane so they can easily pass in and out as needed. Osmotic pressure is the pressure needed to stop the movement of water across the membrane. So basically once it reaches an equilibrium, Right. There will be no more net change or movement of those solutes and water molecules. So in this example, at the beginning of the experiment, we have a salt water or sucrose solution. So we have purple sucrose molecules with blue water molecules right, dipped into a beaker of other water molecules. So the beaker, the water in the beaker, has a greater concentration of water molecules than inside this bag. So the water is going to be drawn inside the bag to try to space out the sugar molecules. So we have an equal ratio of space between the sucrose and the water. So once it reaches equilibrium, right, again, there's no net change or movement of water. So it's not going to keep swelling and swelling. It's not going to shrink back down. It's going to remain pretty stable at equilibrium. So different types of solutions can drive this process of osmosis in different directions. So an isotonic solution is where the concentrations are equal inside and outside of the cell. So essentially it's already naturally at equilibrium. So there's no net movement and the cell is pretty stable and happy. In a hypotonic solution, solute concentration is lower in the solution outside the cell than inside the cell. Okay, so hypo means below normal. Right, so again, we're talking about the solution that the cell is inside. Right, so the cell is soaked in this solution, this hypotonic solution. See, there's more black dots in the cells, like per space, per area. So water is going to want to move inside of the cell to help dilute these solutes up. So if too much water enters the cell, it can burst and die, which is called osmotic lysis. So again, notice how with the isotonic solution, inside and outside of the cell has kind of an equal ratio and spacing of these solute particles. Right? Compared to your hypotonic, it's more dilute, they're more spaced out outside of the cell. So then a hypertonic, so hyper meaning above normal. Um, so the solute concentration in the solution is higher 
than what's inside of the cell. So again, water wanting to reach equilibrium, wanting to dilute those concentrated solutions. So now it's going to move out of the cell to try to space these solutes out more. So the cell will shrink um, or crenate and die. So this is also called plasmolysis. So again, isotonic, the cell is happy. There's no net movement. Hypotonic, so water is going to move inside the cell. Hypertonic, water is going to leave the cell. So your hypotonic solution is more dilute, right? more watered down than what's inside of the cell. Your hypertonic solution is more concentrated than what is inside the cell. Active transport is going to require energy, so in the form of ATP. So again, active transport, we're going upstream or uphill. We're going against that gradient. So natural diffusion would want to go from high to low. So in order to kind of go against the natural flow, we need that ATP energy to help pump it across. Group translocation is a type of active transport that requires a transporter protein to help carry that substance across the membrane. So it's a bit like the facilitated diffusion, but again, we're going against the gradient. So prokaryotes have some similarities to eukaryotic cells. So all cells have the same basic structures. Um, so plasma membrane, uh, cytoplasm made primarily of water, right? some proteins, ions, other substances, and a cytoskeleton to help support the overall shape and structure of the cell. The nucleoid is the genetic region of a prokaryotic cell. So remember, they don't have a true nucleus, so they don't have a defined home for their DNA and genetic material. But the nucleoid is just the general part of the cell where you find the DNA. So the bacterial chromosome, again, unlike eukaryotic chromosomes, is circular. So our chromosomes, when you look at it under the microscope, are those little X-shaped chromosomes we talked about. With bacteria, theirs is just one big circle that's just kind of floating out in the open inside the cell cytoplasm. Plasmids are unique to prokaryotes. So these are actually extra chromosomal genetic material. So it's extra genes considered like bonus DNA and extra chromosome. So it's not part of the main chromosome that has all of the instructions how to make and maintain a cell. It's extra chromosomes, bonus genes for things like antibiotic resistance or toxin production. So generally non-crucial genes, just more kind of bonus genes. So plasmids are interesting in that they're not crucial. So the cell, bacterial cell can live without the plasmid. So we're able to remove these plasmid DNA chromosomes and manipulate them and then reinsert them into other bacterial cells for biotechnology and bioengineering, which we'll talk about later in the semester. But these plasmids are frequently used to transmit DNA from one bacterium to another. Prokaryotes also have ribosomes, just like eukaryotes do, because all cells require proteins and ribosomes make proteins. But the difference is the prokaryotes have these smaller sized ribosomes, so the 70S. We said the eukaryotes have the larger 80S, except for mitochondria and chloroplasts in plant and animal cells. So they also have those smaller 70S ribosomes. Some bacterial cells may have inclusions. So these are mostly for some type of nutrient or energy storage in a cell. Metachromatic granules, sometimes referred to as volutin, are phosphate reserves. So phosphate is used to make lots of biological molecules, including ATP, energy. Polysaccharide granules, so things like starch and sugar storage that cells will need for energy production. Lipid inclusions and sulfur granules, so again, energy reserves for that energy production. Carboxysomes are storage forms of the enzyme for photosynthesis. So Rubisco enzyme is chloroplast used to convert the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere into glucose or sugar. So these enzymes just help 
facilitate that chemical reaction. So they store this enzyme in your carboxysomes. Gas vacuoles are essentially little air bubbles within the cell, aquatic cells, to maintain buoyancy. Um, so kind of like a swim bladder in a fish. So it helps them if they need to go deeper in the water or go higher up toward the surface to control their depth in the water. Magnetosomes are iron oxide inclusions in some bacteria that destroy hydrogen peroxide. Endospores are considered resting cells, and they're generally only produced when nutrients are depleted. So when times are hard, uh, conditions in the environment are rough, um, the cells aren't really doing well, they can make endospores that are very resistant to environmental factors, things like desiccation or drying out, um, heat, chemicals, radiation. It's a lot like little bacterial seeds. So we have some seeds that can be a thousand years old and they'll still germinate and grow new plants. Endospores are typically produced by bacillus and clostridium species. Um, so we'll do an endospore stain in lab with some bacillus that you'll get to see. Sporulation is the endospore formation, the process of endospore formation. So germination would be again just like a seed when that endospore returns to the vegetative state. Right, or when that seed starts to sprout again. So the process of sporulation or endospore formation, the cell is under some type of stress. It's triggering this endospore production process. Um, so we'll copy the bacterial chromosome and DNA, um, and then a spore septum begins to form. So we're going to start to block off this new chromosome. So same thing with the cell membrane, just isolating this DNA. Um, we add more layers to the membrane, right, when we add our peptidoglycan, and then a thick, durable spore coat. It's kind of like a seed coat, that hard outer shell. So once the endospore has matured, the cell, right, so the original DNA starts to break down. The cell is dying. And it'll have a swollen terminal end. So you'll see this under the microscope. They'll look kind of like they're pregnant right, with these endospores until eventually the cell will rupture and the endospore is freed from the cell where it can lay dormant almost indefinitely. So some type of trigger in the environment, some chemical stimulus will let the endospore know when it's time for it to germinate and come back alive. So even though prokaryotes and eukaryotes are very different. Right? They still share a evolutionary history. So it's theorized that life arose as very simple single-celled organisms around three to four billion years ago. So the first eukaryotes evolved around 2.5 billion years ago. So this means for the first roughly billion, billion and a half years of life's history were these simple single-celled organisms like bacteria. But it was the bacteria and these simple organisms that ultimately gave rise to the eukarya and all of the diversity in life that we see today. Endosymbiotic theory explains the evolution of eukaryotes. So back when all life was prokaryotic, single-celled, simple organisms, a larger bacterial cell engulfed a smaller aerobic bacteria cell, which ultimately led to the development of the first eukaryotes. So when the larger cell ingested a photosynthetic cyanobacteria, this went on to become plant cells. The ones that ingested the aerobic bacteria became mitochondria and plant and animal cells. So looking at the word endosymbiotic, so endo means inside, symbiotic means a mutually beneficial relationship. So basically a smaller cell found a safe home inside of a larger cell, right? So that was the benefit for our smaller bacteria. The benefit for the larger cell was that the smaller one would make ATP energy for it. Right, so it didn't have to worry about making its own energy or getting its own food as much. So that as a whole, they were both able to survive better. So over a long period of time, they just no longer were able to live on their own and became inseparable. So that aerobic bacteria eventually just 
became a part of the larger bacteria. So some evidence that helps support this endosymbiotic theory is we talked about the ribosomes, right? There's two different types of ribosomes, the ADS for the eukaryotes and the 70S found in the prokaryotes. Well, mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own ribosomes, and they are the 70S smaller prokaryotic ribosomes. Mitochondria and chloroplasts also have their own DNA, and it's in a circular chromosome. So the circular chromosome, just like in prokaryotes and bacteria. Right, so if you've heard of mitochondrial DNA that's only passed from the mother, right, because that's a completely separate strand of DNA than what's in the nucleus of your cells. And it's only passed from the mother because there are no mitochondria in sperm. So the sperm is what delivers the father's half right, of the offspring. So there are no of the father's mitochondria make it to the egg. The egg only contains the mother's mitochondria. Another thing that helps support this endosymbiotic theory is that mitochondria and chloroplasts can also divide on their own via binary fission, just like bacteria do. So this phenomenon of endosymbiosis is still occurring today in nature. So we've all heard of coral bleaching. So have you ever wondered how a coral becomes bleached? So healthy corals are vibrant, they have lots of those pretty colors, um, but what's giving corals their color is actually an algae. So the coral and algae depend on each other to survive. When it's healthy, it'll have those vibrant colors. So the algae would be the coral's primary food source. They actually live kind of in and on the tissues of the coral. If the coral becomes stressed, so say if temperatures rise in the water, if pH changes too much in the water, there's pollution, anything that can stress that coral, um, the algae will leave. Right? So they will leave the coral tissues and try to find a better home. And in the process, the coral is going to start to lose its color. So once all of the algae leave the coral, it's now bleached. Right? And it's considered vulnerable. So without the algae, the coral loses its major source of food. It's also more susceptible to disease. Another interesting example is solar-powered sea slug. So this sea slug eats algae in the water. Um, and then it takes the chloroplasts from those algae cells and incorporates the chloroplasts into its own tissue. So it kind of is harvesting the organs from its algae food. Eventually, these sea slugs can accumulate enough chloroplasts in their tissues that they don't have to eat at all anymore. They can become completely photosynthetic animals. Another similar example is with algae and salamanders. So the algae actually grow in the eggs of the salamanders. So as the salamanders grow and develop, those algae are also living and developing inside cells of those salamanders. So given enough time, it looks like evolution is starting to tend toward photosynthesis in the animal kingdom as well.